Well, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, um, some of you may be familiar with the words of uh, St. Francis. Uh, St. Francis once said that Christians are to preach the gospel wherever they go, and if necessary, to use words. Preach the gospel wherever you go, and if necessary, use words. In other words, our lifestyle is to be a preaching of the gospel. The way that you treat the person who makes your coffee in the morning, the way that you deal with your clients, your customers, your suppliers. There's, there should be something about the gospel that's evident in your everyday life. Right? Wherever we go, our lives should demonstrate the goodness and the kindness of Jesus Christ. Now, that's a little bit what Peter has been describing for us over the last couple of weeks as we've uh, looked at 1 Peter. Uh, a couple, about three weeks ago, we looked earlier in chapter 2 where Peter says that as Christians, we are to live such good or, or such beautiful or attractive lives among the nations that they see how we live and they don't look at us so much as they look at Jesus. Our, our lifestyle is to be a testimony to Jesus. How we live is to draw people uh, to Christ. And then what Peter does is he takes that idea of, of beautiful living or of attractive living and he says, what does that look like in different arenas or different areas of society? And we've looked already at how Peter applies this idea into uh, our relationship with, with civil authority, with government. And then we looked, uh, two Sundays ago, we looked at how Peter applies this to, uh, to workplace settings or more broadly to places where we might be mistreated or treated unjustly, unkindly because of our faith. And Peter says there's a way that we live that really draws people to Christ even through those kinds of circumstances. And now what Peter is doing is he's taking that, that broader idea of, of beautiful living or attractive living and he's saying, what might it look like in the arena of marriage and home and family? How do we live beautiful and attractive lives in the context of marriage? Now you need to know, I think, right up front that it's going to take us at least two weeks to get through this. Uh, we're focusing this morning, you heard what Peter says, to wives and uh, just so husbands aren't feeling like you're off the hook, next week we come back and we're going to talk about what does God say to husbands. Okay, so we're not neglecting one or the other. We're going to focus, I think, equally on, on both. Because God has something very important to say to both of us. The thing is, when we hear and when we listen to what God says to wives, um, some of us may have some difficulty with this. This is one of these passages in the Bible that will probably give some of us pause. In some ways, especially if you're, well, if you're somewhat new to Christianity, maybe you're here just kind of checking out what is Christianity really all about, and then you, you come in and you hear a text that talks about submission. Some of us may be saying, you see, Christianity is kind of outdated, it's old-fashioned. Um, and you may push back a little bit. You may be a little bit resistant to the ideas that Peter is describing here. And I guess I want to say that we're wrestling with this whole idea, that may actually be a very, very good thing. If, if we have some initial pushback to this idea, that can be a good sign. And, and I want to give you at least a couple reasons why before we actually get into the specifics of what Peter is saying. The first reason why it might be a good sign that we push back a little is that this is one of those passages in the Bible that's been misused over the centuries. It's a passage that's been used to justify abuse, and control, and it's a passage that's been used to, uh, to, to really be oppressive. And so when you hear this text, and, and if, if you're resisting and saying, wait a minute, you know, we don't, how can the Bible possibly justify or support, you know, oppressing women or wives? How can it justify abuse? If, if that's your reaction, well, that's good, because we should always resist misapplications or, mis, uh, or misunderstandings of what the Bible says. We should always push back against the ways that the Bible is distorted. And the idea of justifying abuse and oppression is, is a distortion. So we should resist that. 
And, and the second reason why our resistance to a passage like this might be a good thing is, is that it, it can be a sign that our relationship with God is, is, is dynamic. And here's what I mean by that. God, uh, God speaks to us through his word. We believe that if we have a relationship with God, then, uh, then God wants to help us grow. He wants to challenge us. He wants to correct us. He wants to help us rethink places in our worldview that may be inaccurate. And the way that God does that is by speaking to us through his word. And so when we come across a passage and we resist it a little bit, that is a sign that actually we have a relationship with God that is dynamic, it's living, it's, it's active. In other words, maybe look at it the opposite way. If we read the Bible each and every day, if we study his word, and we never find ourselves being challenged or corrected or having our understandings of the world yeah, challenged by the scriptures, then we have to ask, are we really hearing God carefully? Are we really listening properly to God's word? Or have we made a God that's just sort of in our own image? Have we just come up with this invention of God that just is okay with everything we do and doesn't really ever want to correct us or challenge us? And, and so if we read the Bible and we find ourselves being challenged and maybe pushing back sometimes, it's a sign that we have a relationship with God that God is speaking to us and working with us and correcting us and challenging us sometimes. Now that said, if, if you are sitting here this morning and you, you are finding yourself challenged here, you're pushing back a little bit, maybe you even want to say, this is flat out wrong, this is old fashioned, it doesn't apply today. Uh, I guess I want to ask you to, to maybe wrestle with a couple of questions. The first is this, what is it in this passage specifically that gives you trouble? What is the specific idea that you are saying, there's no way that can be biblical or true? Or, right? What is it that specifically you object to? And then. And then ask yourself this, are we resisting the idea because it's what the Bible says or because it's what we've heard that the Bible says? And there's a difference, right? I mean, sometimes we can assume that we know exactly what the Bible's talking about and what it means and we are pushing back against that distortion and not about what the Bible really says. So, so maybe take that to heart, especially if you're inclined to just resist this altogether. And one of, the, one of the ways that we can know that we're hearing carefully what the Bible actually says versus the distortion of it is by paying careful attention to the actual context. What was really going on? Why did Peter need to write this letter? Why did he need to address this? And one of the things that was happening and one of the reasons that prompted Peter to write these words was that in the church you had, uh, you had women who were coming to Christ. They were married, they were wives, and they were coming to faith in Jesus, but their husbands in many cases were not. So the wives were becoming believers, the husbands were not, and there was a question, well, what is that going to do to the family structure? What is that going to do to marriages? And the fear, it seems, was that conversion to Christ was becoming something of a, of a threat. There was concern that... Um, well, these women were going to become, well, they're going to nag their husbands all the time. You know, you should believe in Jesus, and what's the matter with you? You need to come to church, you need to believe what I do, and you know what, you know, looking down on them, becoming very nagging towards them, or even um, self-righteous towards them, or even in some cases, there was a concern that wives were going to start divorcing their husbands all over the place, because, well, if he doesn't share my faith anymore, then I'm going to divorce him. And if that were to happen and spread, then that would present a real threat to the health and well-being of the society itself. So Peter has this concern in mind. And the question then that he wants to raise is, how should wives live in a, in a way that is winsome? How should wives practice and live out their Christian faith in this setting? And what Peter says is, um, he says, don't live your life in such a way that you are driving your husband, your unbelieving husband, away from faith in Jesus Christ, but do the opposite. Live your life in a way that is compelling. Live your life in a way that is attractive. Live your life in such a way that you show the beauty of Jesus Christ to your spouse. Right? Don't leave your husband. Don't nag him. Don't be all self-righteous, but honor him as husband. And, uh, and then, 
he even, Peter uses actually a play on words. He says, if your husband doesn't believe the word, if he doesn't believe the gospel, then hopefully he can be one without words by your lifestyle. And again, it's back to that little saying that I began with. Preach the gospel wherever you go, and if necessary, use words. If you have a husband who doesn't want to listen to your faith in Jesus Christ, if you have a husband who's not responsive or receptive to the gospel, then you need to show by your lifestyle that there is something deeply attractive and compelling about your faith in Jesus Christ. Those who don't believe the word will be one without words. Now, I think it's important to make a little caveat here, add on a little sort of thought that maybe comes into your mind. Peter is not endorsing or advocating for what we used to call, at least I did, friends that I had in high school, missionary dating. Now, when I was in ninth grade, a family moved in across the street. Found out before the family moved in that they had two daughters. One of them was my age. And so I said to myself, this is perfect. And I made up my mind that I was going to try to date this girl. And I didn't even, sight unseen, right? And, and I thought, this is, you know, it doesn't get any better. And sure enough, lo and behold, the family moved in and we met and we started out dating out in ninth grade. I don't know what that really is all about, but that's what we call it. Okay, we were dating and um, getting to know each other a little bit better. Found out very quickly this was a, a, a girl that did not share my faith in Jesus Christ, didn't, you know, didn't share my convictions. And my parents talked to me about that once. And I said, in all my ninth grade wisdom, I said, well, wait a minute, I can, I can tell her about Jesus. I can be a good influence. I can be a good witness to her. That doesn't work, I found out. It was not that much longer after that, and uh, my mom sat down with me again and said, I think you really need to, to end this, because you're with someone that doesn't share your most basic convictions and faith in Jesus Christ. Now, again, that was ninth grade, and, you know, you sort of do sort of a learning curve in your ninth grade. But Peter and the rest of Scripture would say that if you are dating someone who does not share your most basic convictions and faith in Jesus Christ, then you're not to be yoked to that person, meaning you're not to share a lifelong commitment to one another if you don't share the same commitment to Jesus Christ. But the other, I guess, point of application here is that is for those of us here that may find ourselves, and maybe you are married to someone who doesn't share your faith. What do you do? Well, Peter would say again, let your actions, let the way you talk, let the way you live, let the way you treat your husband, show the power and the goodness of Jesus Christ. If you find yourself in that situation, let your lifestyle speak the gospel to them. And that principle, Peter's obviously applying here directly to marriage, but I think the principle applies more broadly. What do you do if you have an unbelieving child, relative, close friend? Well, sometimes our most powerful witness is the way we live our lives. We show the beauty of Christ in our actions. And that can often be Every bit as powerful as words, and sometimes it's more powerful than words because people tune us out after a time. We get tired of hearing about it all the time. We're not to be nagging, we're not to be self-righteous, we're not to be hypercritical of our unbelieving friends and neighbors. If they won't listen to our words, then let our lifestyle preach the gospel. Now, this is not the only place in the Bible where Marriage is talked about. This is not the only place in Scripture where submission is talked about. What Peter is doing here is he's, he's addressing wives in general. You notice that there in verse 1. He says, wives, be submissive. And then he narrows the focus to talk to wives who are in a marriage to an unbelieving spouse. But the general principle does apply to all wives. He's saying, Peter is saying, wives, be submissive. That's a principle that's established elsewhere in the New Testament, particularly in Ephesians chapter 5. Now, here again, people have, in the past, they've looked at this text, they've looked at Ephesians 5, and they say, well, that was cultural. Right? That's something that's outdated. But here's the problem with that. In, uh, in Ephesians 5, 1 Peter here, um, Peter, uh, uh, 
more Ephesians 5. Paul says that wives are to submit, husbands are to love, love their wives. And this is to show and demonstrate the relationship of Jesus Christ and the church. Now, if you're, if you're going to quickly say, well, submission is old-fashioned and outdated, you're really saying that there's something about the relationship of Jesus Christ and the church that also is outdated. In other words, if, if we're going to really take seriously what the Bible says about the relationship of Christ and the church, we have to learn to recognize that marriage is meant to give us a window into that relationship between Jesus and the church. Let me see if I can say that just a little bit more plain, straightforward. Marriage for the Christian is not just about our relationship with our spouse. It's not just about finding happiness with another person. It's not just about companionship. Marriage is meant to be a window into the gospel. Marriage is a window to the gospel. Marriage is meant to show us and to paint a picture of the relationship between the true bride and the true bridegroom, Christ and the church. And so when Peter talks about submission and when Paul talks about submission, it cannot possibly mean just blind obedience, just do whatever I say because I say so and I'm the boss. It cannot possibly mean forced coercion by the husband. You need to listen to me because if you don't, then I'm going to do this and that. It cannot possibly mean that. It cannot possibly mean um, any sort of, of bullying or manipulation or anything of that sort. And furthermore, a text like this does not say anything about um, who pays the bills, who works in the home or outside the home. It doesn't say anything about um, um, the, the particular aspects of you know, roles around the household, who does what work and other work and that sort of thing. It doesn't say any of that. And I would suspect that every married couple and every culture is going to work out the particulars of this a little bit differently. But here's, here's I think, what it does mean. When the Bible talks about submission, submission means honoring, well, let's, let's first say it's the gift, it's the gift of honoring leadership in the home in a winsome way. Let me say that one more time. It's the gift, it's not something that's done against your will or grudgingly, it's a gift. It's honoring the role of leadership in the home. Now, we're going to come back next Sunday. We're going to talk about leadership in the home because we have to be really clear when the Bible talks about leadership, it's servant leadership, it's sacrifice, it's giving. It's incredibly Christ-like. So the leadership that Peter's talking about is not some sort of you know, domination or bullying or anything like that. And it's for the wife that it's honoring that role of leadership. God has put husbands in a role of leadership and uh, that role, we will be accountable for that. If you're a husband, if you're head of the home, you will be accountable for how you are leading. Wives are called to honor that position of leadership in the home, and it's doing it in a way that's, um, well, everything from how you talk about your spouse to other people, how you treat him. It's um, a relationship of trust and respect. It's looking for ways to meet the needs of your spouse. And again, we're going to come back to this next week, and you're going to see a lot of parallels between what husbands are called to do. Now, one of the particular ways that Peter actually works this out has to do in the area of physical beauty, physical attractiveness. Peter then establishes this principle, and then he talks about physical beauty. And he says, your beauty shouldn't come from things like braided hair or golden jewelry or fine garments and fine clothing and that sort of thing. And it would be easy... Um, I think to make the mistake of looking and saying, well, you see, God doesn't really care about fashion, and the Bible says that we shouldn't care at all about fashion. That would be, that would be misleading. Um, even this way, when you hear these words, because there are other places in the Bible, and, and I'm thinking of um, Song of Solomon, for example. There's a book of the Bible where you have a husband and a wife who actually are delighting in the physical appearance of one another. So Peter isn't saying here that Physical attraction never matters or that it's unimportant, but what he is saying is that you cannot measure a person's importance or significance based on their physical appearance. When he describes um, the um, outward adornment, braided hair, wearing gold jewelry, fine clothes, he's talking about um, people who often use their physical appearance to set themselves higher and higher on the social ladder. 
Right? I'm better than you because I wear this designer label or I look like this. There's even some indication that he's talking about, um, uh, he's, he's referring to the way that prostitutes at the temple dress, so you know, dressing prom, uh, promiscuously. And Peter's saying, that's not where your beauty should come from. And I think that's where these words are every bit as important today as they were back then. Now, when I was, again, in junior high, um, Levi jeans were the, were the thing that were in style. But you need to know it wasn't just any Levi jeans. There were, actually, there was a hierarchy, right? You had uh, Levi red tabs and Levi orange tabs. Now, if you, now when it says a tab, it means something about the size of your fingernail, maybe a little smaller, actually. And it was it's sewn into the back pocket of the jeans, so everyone could see it. And an or, or a red tab meant that you were in. You had it made if you had that little red tab sewn into your jeans. Now, if you had an orange tab, pretty well the same pair of jeans, but that little fingernail size piece of cloth was orange and not red. And if you had an orange tab, you might as well not have bought Levi jeans at all because you were out. You just bottom of the social ladder. You didn't count for much. Now, I was sharing this at our senior Bible study on Thursday, and uh, some of the ladies there mentioned that, well, when, it was, when, when we were younger, it was a certain kind of sweater. And I wrote it down. I forgot what it actually said. It was a kind of sweater that if you wore that kind of sweater, you were in. And if you didn't wear that kind of sweater, you were out. We do this all the time, don't we? You look at the pictures on magazines when you're standing in the checkout line at the grocery store and you see the standard of beauty. You look at what people, the celebrities wear on the red carpet and you see the standard of beauty. Our culture is fearful, I think, of aging and growing older and losing our attractiveness. We measure people we do it all the time. We measure people based on their physical appearance, based on the clothes they wear, based on the brand names that they wear. We do it all the time. And you know what? Eventually, it crushes us. It imprisons us. Some of us here know all too well what that's like. You look in the mirror where you compare yourself to someone else. And not only do you feel unattractive, you tell yourself that you're worthless because of what you look like. The standard of beauty in our culture, the standard of physical outward appearances, crushes us. It can hold us hostage. And Peter comes along and he says, don't you see how the gospel transforms that? If you have your Bible still open, look at verse 4. What does Peter say is true beauty? Because your beauty comes from your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. What is beauty? It's really a heart that has been changed by the goodness of God. It's a heart that has been softened by His kindness to you. It's a heart that is, that is built on character that has been formed by God. How do you get it? How do you get this kind of beauty? Well, Peter answers that in verse 5. He says, uh, he's talking about the holy women of the past who put their hope in God. Now, Peter has used this idea of hope a number of times in this letter. He actually started the, the whole letter off back in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. He says, he describes what hope is, and, and really just to summarize, hope is, is our belief about the future that shapes our present. It's, it's our belief in, in who God says we are. It's our confidence in the promises of God. And who does God say that we are? By faith in Jesus Christ, you and I are, we're his children. We've, brought, we've been brought into his family. We belong to him. We are precious to him. We are infinitely valuable to him. He looks at us and sees us as absolutely precious and beautiful. He's made us his very own children. He's brought us into the family. And our future rests eternally secure with him. 
to believe that is to put our hope in the living God. It's to know that our beauty comes from who God says we are, not who magazine covers say we look like, the other people around the world, people in our culture. Our beauty comes from what God thinks of us. Now some of us might be sitting here and you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's fine and good. The idea of submission, okay, good. Beauty, good. You're thinking, I'm not married. You're single, for whatever reason. You're not been married, you're no longer married, you're a widow. Um, some of us are lonely. And actually, a sermon like this actually sort of stirs up those feelings of loneliness. You miss your spouse all the more. Right now, you're in a marriage that isn't going real well. You just sort of feel like you've drifted apart, and, and there's pain because of that. And you might be sitting there thinking, does this really say anything to me? Well, I want to remind us again that when the Bible describes marriage for us, it's never just about marriage. This is meant to give us a glimpse into the greater marriage that we all look forward to, that we all are uh, that we're all a part of. This passage is meant to show us and point us to Jesus, who is the true and greater spouse. He's the spouse that we all need. He's the spouse that we all long for. He alone is the, is the, is the bridegroom that can meet our deepest needs and satisfy the deepest longings of our heart. Jesus is the spouse who, who submits first. I mean, Jesus is our spouse who knows the will of the Father in heaven, and, and he knows that submitting to the will of the Father would mean going all the way to death. And not just any death, but the most cruel and painful death imaginable. And Jesus says, I will submit myself to that in order to save my people. Jesus is the spouse who submits himself for us, for our benefit. Jesus is, is our true and greater spouse who actually lost his beauty so that we might gain it. I mean, before all time, Jesus was more beautiful and more perfect in his appearance than anyone else. And yet he sets that all aside, and Isaiah chapter 53 reminds us that Jesus became as one we couldn't even look on because his appearance was so disfigured and so hideous. He took that on. That was the ugliness of our sin, and he took that on. He lost his beauty so that in Christ we might be made beautiful. Jesus is our true and greater spouse who draws all of us into his eternal embrace. Jesus is the spouse who can love us in the way that no earthly spouse can. He alone is the one that meets our deepest needs. He alone can love us in the way that no other person can. And so our marriages are meant to be a reflection of that. And whether we're married, whether we're single, we can seek our, we can seek the love of our true and greater bridegroom. Now every marriage in this room, every marriage that's represented here is, is imperfect. There's tension, there's conflict that marked every last one. But here's the thing, we're all in need of grace. Whether we're married, whether we're single, we all need the grace of Jesus. We all need the love that only He can give. And God has offered that to us freely in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's seek that love in Christ, and let's seek to be a reflection of that love in our marriages, in our homes, our families, and in our daily life. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise that your love for us is perfect. Every other earthly love will let us down. Every other love from every other person will be imperfect. Lord, you alone love us the way we long to be loved, the way we need to be loved. You alone are our perfect companion. And we thank you for the way that you love us by submitting yourself all the way to death. We thank you for the way that you love us by giving yourself over for our sins. And we thank you for the beauty that we enjoy in Jesus. And we pray that our marriages, for those of us in this room that are married, we pray that you would help us by your Holy Spirit to reflect your love and your commitment <coughs> in our own marriages. And we pray for those who are not married, perhaps some were anticipate being married, some looking forward to it, some not sure. Lord, we pray that um, we too 
would enjoy the love that you offer us in Jesus and that our daily life would be a reflection of that true and perfect love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.